is much in Belgos and uh, I'm very glad to have this uh, honor to deliver the first talk today. I'm so surprised to be that, that successful. Uh, so my talk uh, will be about the uh, magnetorotational instabilities in black hole vicinity. This is what I declared, but this plural here, here changed uh, since I declared the subject. Uh, so let's proceed. Uh, so the plan was to uh, talk about two uh, slightly different subjects. And the first subject uh, that I intended to uh, talk about uh, is the Commissar of Taurus and uh, the question whether it is a, a stable steady state solution uh, to the MHD equation, uh, equations in general uh, case. Uh, and this one I will do. But I also wanted to uh, talk some more about uh, whether classic uh, Balbus Hole MRI mode uh, uh, still operates well uh, in a plunging region where uh, the advection is uh, not to be neglected, where there is significant uh, radial velocity. Uh, but for several reasons I will not uh, be talking about it. One of the reasons is the uh, time limitation. The other thing is that uh, both of these are work in progress and the second one is even more in progress. Uh, so it's not uh, ripe enough to, uh, to be talked about, I guess. Uh, okay, so we still have that one interesting subject. Uh, it is the uh, Commissar of uh, Torus Stability. So for those of you uh, who perhaps uh, do not know uh, what is a Commissar of Torus, uh, this is uh, a generalization to what we call a, po a Polish donut or a Fig disk, a to torus that orbits uh, around a compact object. Uh, so uh, the Polish donut is a hydrodynamical uh, solution, uh, and what Komisarov did in 2006 is uh, he added uh, a toroidal magnetic field. So although there were previously some solutions that involved solving Gerstochranov equations in uh, nasty numerical ways, um, what Komisarov did is. Uh, kind of a singular solution, but it's really uh, a simple analytic solution. So it's a very good thing, for example, as a benchmark for the uh, uh, MHD uh, so solvers. <coughs> so this is uh, where, where importance of this solution uh, lays. So the example of how the Commissar of Torus could look like, uh, what you see here is the, well, it's uh, a cross section and it's uh, Half of the half of the half of a torus, right? There, should, there is a black hole about here. There is a, a one part of the torus here in the cross section, the other here. But no reason for the redundancy. We only show this one uh, for fourth part. Uh, and you have uh, uh, equatorial distribution of the enthalpy uh, uh, plotted uh, here. Okay, so what are the parameters that uh, specify the uh, Commissar of uh, solution? Well, of course, one needs to determine uh, the uh, black hole mass and uh, spin uh, to have a background uh, uh, space time. And uh, once we have that specified, we, we need uh, to uh, give an angular momentum distribution. Actually, in order to do all the, these beautiful integrations, one needs to specify an angular momentum as a function of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, azimuthal frequency. Uh, but uh, since we have uh, the von Zeipel theorem uh, and those two uh, distributions uh, where uh, eigenpotential lines coincide, uh, one always can do that. One can express uh, the specific angular momentum as a function of the angular velocity. Uh, well, of course, the easiest way, the easiest possible function of, uh, of uh, azimuthal velocity, of uh, angular uh, velocity, is a constant function of angular velocity. Uh, I use frequency and velocity <laughs> uh, interchangeably. Uh, so that's the constant function, the, the easiest uh, possible thing. That's what uh, Komisarov did in his paper. But of course, one can apply uh, more complicated functions here. 
So once we have that, we have uh, background space time and we have the uh, eigenpotential structure uh, once we have those two. So now we need to decide how much do we feel uh, that, uh, that uh, potential with, uh, with gas. So this is that uh, filling par parameter. So for zero, uh, close to zero, it would be very small. And there is some limit to it, which I will uh, t tell uh, about I in a second. Uh, Okay, so these are the parameters that also ca characterize the, uh, uh, the Polish donut. But then you have one more parameter uh, which uh, just tells you uh, what is gas to magnetic pressure ratio at the central point. So uh, just to tell you about, oh, that, that would be the that again potential uh, uh, structure that is common uh, for. Uh, M many physical quantities in particular uh, it's the same structure <coughs> for the specific angular momentum and the uh, same structure uh, for uh, omega if it's not constant uh, actually the, and this one plotted here is the uh, the one for an uh, 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 okay so uh, if we take the uh, the equatorial plane and we uh, look at the values of uh, specific angular momentum, we, we know the Keplerian distribution that would be the, the one uh, with dashed lines and the, the one that I showed, the, the, the one for that uh, torus that uh, we are discussing now is the constant one 2.8. Uh, so you see it, uh, it will cross twice uh, the Keplerian distribution, so, uh, uh, so it means that there will be two such points in, uh, in which there is no uh, gradient of pressure. Uh, that is the center of the torus, one of these points, the, the point where we define our, uh, our quantities to uh, determine, uh, to specify the model. But we also have the other uh, point uh, where they cross, and this is the cusp. So the cusp would be uh, a place where uh, eigenpotential uh, surface cro crosses itself. What, what it means is that we, when we feel uh, the, the torus more, more and more, uh, once uh, there is enough gas to, uh, uh, to, to get to that uh, cusp, when it's more, it will just dynamically inflow on, onto the black hole. So this is uh, all, I, I believe it's, uh, these are things that uh, most of you uh, know very well, but it's good to begin with something that everyone uh, knows. Mm. Okay, so about Commissar uh, of uh, Torus uh, stability. What is known about that subject is that it is stable under the axis metric perturbations. Uh, this was actually shown by Komisarov in his uh, first paper. He, do, uh, he has done uh, some numerical experiments on the top of his uh, theoretical uh, analytic investigations and he uh, showed that uh, or verified that uh, it is stable when you consider uh, to the 2D simulation. In other words, uh, when you don't have the azimuthal uh, structure of the mode. In other words, it's an axismetric mode. Uh, well, once you are in 3D, you will uh, uh, have another problem with Komisarov uh, that uh, the papalois sprinkle instability can kick in, uh, which is global and hydrodynamical uh, I instability. Uh, well, but the question that we are interested, that we were interested in, uh, was whether we could find in the Komisarov torus anything like the classic MRI, any instability that would be only pre present in, with the magnetic field and that would be intrinsically local. Uh, so that's the question that uh, that uh, we want to uh, wanted to address in in this research that I'm presenting. Is there anything like the classic MRI? Uh, anything that uh, in, in terms of its characteristic behaves like the classic MRI mode. Well, so the simulations seem uh, to answer yes, uh, and there is a natural candidate for the uh, interpretation of that, which would be the non axisymmetric MRI of uh, Balbus Howley. And uh, before I proceed, I would show you a movie, if the movie works on that computer. Very short movie. in the folder movies. So, 
To illustrate that, what I said, this is the uh, 2D simulation of the Commissar of uh, Taurus, and uh, you you do not see much because not much is happening. Uh, it is stable for the axisymmetric perturbations. So if you look closely, there were maybe some ripples on the uh, background uh, uh, where the. Uh, at the border of the torus, but nothing really happened. It did not start accreting. It did not uh, uh, indicate any kind of uh, dynamical instability. Uh, okay, but now we do the very same thing only in uh, 3D simulation, and that is the, the same time. Uh, all of the parameters are the same. And the total run, uh, running time of this simulation is about uh, four orbital periods in the in the center of the torus. So you see a very nice instability. It's so nice that I will play it just one, one more time. Uh, you, you will see a very nice instability developing here, and accretion uh, begins. Uh, the inflow begins. So it, of course, it's not anymore uh, a stationary so solution. There is no. Uh, no uh, refilling uh, of, of, of the gas. Was it control M? Yes. Okay, so that was enough movies. Uh, I, I, I have more. Uh, so these were the simulations that seem to answer yes to that, uh, that question. So now let's try to understand it uh, on some perhaps d deeper level than just uh, with, with this kind of simulations. These are global simulations uh, of uh, GRMHD. Uh, they were performed uh, not on whole torus, though one could say it's two and a half that, that dimension. They were uh, performed on the quarter of torus just for the reason of the uh, time necessary for the calculation. Uh, it still lasted for um, several weeks to produce th this kind of uh, results on uh, rubber fast uh, cluster. So that is one good reason to use just fourth part of the torus instead of the full torus. So, uh, okay, you've seen that already. This is just the final uh, final frame of uh, both of these movies. Uh, 2D simulation and 3D simulation with very same uh, uh, with, with very same parameters. Uh, okay, so what we will try to do in order to understand better that uh, uh, that instability, we will try to derive uh, the uh, dispersion relation for the. Commissar of uh, Taurus for the general uh, non axisymmetric mode. And actually, I, I put um, uh, many equations here, and then now I doubt w w why the hell did I do that? It's, uh, I will just go through these equations to something uh, nicer to, to, to show. Uh, okay, but uh, ju just to make some use of that, uh, let me comment that. Uh, in this research, we do not perturb the radial Euler equation. And we don't do that. And we hope that since uh, Euler equations, there are four Euler equations, and there are four components of four velocity, which are not independent, because there is a constant norm of four velocity. Our hope is that uh, if we use a uh, norm of four velocity instead of uh, radial Euler, it will be all the same. But it's, uh, we are pretty sure about that, but uh, it, it is still a, a weak point, I, I would say. But we have all of the induction equations and the continuity equation. And the, these are the two constraints for the norm of for velocity and for the orthogonality between uh, the magnetic four vector and uh, the four velocity. So uh, in total, we have. Uh, nine quantities, uh, four components of four velocity, four components of the uh, magnetic uh, four vector, and some thermodynamical quantity, uh, let's say, and uh, enthalpy. Uh, well, we have more equations than we need. Uh, actually, if we, if we use 
two constraints, we can uh, get rid of uh, two of other equations. We don't have radial Euler, so we can re get rid of only of one equation. And uh, what we what we do to somehow to verify the consistency of that approach is we do the analysis uh, without one chosen induction equation. And we found out that whichever we neglect, whichever induction equation we neglect, we get the same results. So this is something that could be a little bit reassuring in that uh, thing that we are doing here. Uh, okay, uh, so what you seen was uh, an, a system of uh, perturbed MHD uh, <coughs> equations. Uh, so now how to solve it? Of course, uh, one have uh, eight equations. It's very difficult to get algebraically the dispersion relation and, and uh, solve it. But it's not that difficult to perform a numerical like an analysis of matrices of size eight times eight. This is not uh, unusual thing to do for, for people. So since, uh, since we assume local linear perturbation, uh, it's a uh, uh, harmonic function is involved. So once we differentiate it, we will have uh, omega, but only in the first, uh, first order of omega, uh, because it's a uh, uh, derivative of exponent i times omega times t. So this omega uh, appears here. It's a linear func uh, matrix function of omega. S0 is a background solution. Omega is a, a frequency and Ki is the wave number. Uh, so we can uh, write it down as thi this sort of uh, system of equations. Uh, okay, so uh, the, the problem of solving the eigenfrequencies, the, the modes, uh, uh, is just uh, uh, to perform eigenanalysis of this matrix S. So uh, one could write it down in that, that way for some eigenvector uh, delta v, some perturbation uh, eigenvector, uh, uh, one need to solve this kind of equation. Uh, well, uh, the pro a little bit of problem could be with the fact that A uh, can easily uh, be uh, uh, a singular matrix. Uh, but uh, it's all in the numerics uh, and numerical algorithms uh, do very well with uh, this kind of situation. This is called generalized, uh, uh, generalized eigenfrequency analysis. And uh, the fact that A can be singular is, is not really an obstacle for the uh, good solvers. Uh, well, so we can even write down the dispersion relation uh, the polyno uh, dispersion relation polynomial. That would be it. That would be just the uh, uh, determinant of that uh, matrix. Of course, in order to uh, to give uh, uh, all the coefficients of the polynomial, it would be terrible thing uh, to to calculate to, to, to calculate it from the uh, matrix of uh, 64 entries, 8 times 8. Uh, so we, we we don't do that. We we only rely on the, the numerical. Uh, code to do that. Okay, so uh, we ask computer, we ask uh, these eigenfrequency solvers, uh, tell us what are the eigenfrequencies of, of that matrix. Uh, and uh, we get some results. So what results are these and how do they compare uh, with what we could expect uh, fr from the uh, MRI mode? First of all, we find that there are no local unstable modes when we do not have a magnetic field. Well, that's very w nice because that's what we would expect from the uh, uh, MRI mode. Uh, no local uh, axisymmetric uh, modes. That's also very well because that's what Komisarov said. That wha that's what he calculated, that there are no... Uh, the, the torus is sta stable once we consider uh, to the simulation. Uh, so there are no local axisymmetric modes, well, no instable, I, I, I should say, no unstable axisymmetric modes, that, that's what I meant by that. Uh, okay, so that's also fine. Uh, well, there is a single unstable mode uh, when we consider non-axisymmetric perturbation and when we have non-zero um, magnetic field. So this is basically a combination of two others, but uh, still it's nice to put another plus. Uh, uh, well, 
Instability exists, uh, instability exists uh, even for a very weak uh, magnetic field. Uh, this is uh, also uh, similar to, to the MRI. Uh, the magnetic field can be uh, negligible in terms of uh, influence on, on the structure of the torus, but it's enough to have any magnetic uh, field, uh, well, numerically any uh, magnetic field, to produce uh, this kind of instability. Uh, so, check. It's again uh, something like we would expect from the MRI mode. Uh, well, there is a little dependence of the, on the radial wave number, and this is actually not that, uh, that uh, doesn't go that well with what we know about the MRI mode, but I will offer an explanation uh, to, to that. Uh, okay, growth rate uh, scales with azimuthal wave number. So this is another thing that is a little bit tricky, but the same explanation <laughs> will go to, to, to that one. I, I will give the explanation a little bit later. Uh, well, and purely as a mutual character, and by that I mean that uh, the instability seems to only grow on the azimuthal and time components, uh, not on the ra radial component. Uh, the, the classic MRI does not uh, have zero amplitudes in the vertical direction, so this is very well, uh, very nice that we don't have the vertical amplitude. But why no radial uh, uh, amplitude? Again, there, there will be an attempt to explain that at the end of that, uh, that talk. Uh, and by the way, uh, the global MHD uh, simulations uh, seem to confirm that, uh, seem to con confirm that uh, the amplitude on the, in the radial direction uh, is negligible. Uh, so this is a well, strange behavior that uh, it, it's not exactly what one could expect from, from the uh, something one could call MRI. Uh, okay, using that knowledge that there are uh, no amplitudes in the uh, radial direction, uh, we were able to deliver uh, a simplified analytic uh, res result. So from this very big ma matrix 8 times 8, uh, after looking at it for several days, one could uh, com come up with th this kind of uh, equation. So this is a growth rate, uh, and you see that this thing depends on something that looks uh, surprisingly much like the, the uh, s sound velocity. Uh, also, uh, so low pressure limit means that that would die. Uh, it, it's not present in the low pressure limit. Well, you know, also the growth rate diminish with radius, but that is the interesting thing. It scales with the azimuthal wave number. So, uh, so from that, uh, looking at that one could say, okay, so I can have arbitrarily large uh, uh, growth rates. So that would be a disturbing thing. But again, there will be an attempt to explain that at the, at the la on the last slide. Will be waving hands, but just a bit. Uh, so, if we calculate those growth rates uh, from the numerical codes, but uh, we can do it as well from the simplified formula that I showed on, on the last slide, uh, that's what you get. So, the black line would be the uh, result of this full, uh, full numerical procedure, full numerical eigenanalysis, eight uh, equations, eight variables. Uh, and the blue thing here is the uh, growth rate calculated with that simplified formula. And the, the red one is another is simplified a little bit more, and that black one is that, uh, that last, that, that Newtonian one with the speed of sound. Uh, so actually that simplified formula seems to work uh, pretty well. And the growth rates that uh, are shown here are calculated for the azimuthal wave number equal to one. And as you, uh, as we saw, it scales with that azimuthal wave number. So in order to get a growth rate for mode number four, one should multiply these results by, by four and, and, and so on. Uh, so it's uh, not, that, not negligible. It's, uh, it's of order of tenth parts of, of uh, angular uh, frequency the growth rate, which is, mm, which is about what one would expect from the non-axisymmetric MRI, and it's less what, than what one would expect from the uh, normal MRI. Uh, but it's not a normal MRI for sure, since it is non-axisymmetric. Uh, okay, so now uh, what we did is we tried to take the data from these global 3D uh, uh, MHD simulations, well, or 2.5D 
uh, GRMHD simulations. They were, were done by Chris Fragil. Uh, and we tried to fit results of our linear perturbative analysis uh, onto the growth rates calculated from the quantities uh, outputted uh, by the, this uh, global uh, GRMHD code. So what you see here are, for, for example, the amplitudes of physical quantities, the uh, azimuthal velocity, uh, perturbation, logarithm of it, uh, density, uh, magnetic field here. Uh, so what, what we see, and the mode is uh, uh, 4 and 8, which are the uh, smallest uh, smallest modes, the, the lowest uh, wave, wave number in azimuthal direction that you can model in that uh, uh, code of, of Chris, because uh, we have, have only fourth part of torus, as you remember. It's not a full torus, it's fourth part of torus. So you cannot get mode uh, K5 equal 2. The, the lowest number you can get is 4, that you have, uh, uh, that, that is from uh, uh, constraint to that uh, to that fourth part of the torus with one period. Uh, okay, so what you what we see is actually a very nice agreement. Uh, it's surprisingly nice uh, agreement, I, I would say, uh, because in all of this data there is a region in which it grows basically like uh, like predicted by the linear code. Well, it would be beautiful, but we we tried more than one torus and for. Uh, but before I get to it, let me let me discuss the, that part. So one can easily divide it into uh, some parts of uh, quantitatively different behavior. Uh, we see that here not much is going on. Uh, then a linear growth is uh, beginning, and this is where uh, prediction of uh, of linear analysis seems to work very well. But then, of course, at some point, the background uh, solution changes, and also uh, the nonlinear uh, uh, per perturbations are kicking in. Uh, as we know, the, M the classic MRI operates that uh, uh, angular momentum transfer in, in the nonlinear regime. So, so this is the region where we cannot apply the linear analysis. Uh, if we did, it would go to infinity, which would be just a silly thing. Uh, Okay, let's take a look at a different commissar of solution. It's still quite nice. It's not so nice, but it's quite nice. This is a solution with a smaller growth rate predicted. As you see, the, these lines are uh, less tilted, more tilted. Uh, and this is yet another solution for which is very, uh, very low growth rate predicted. And now it's very messy. It's difficult to tell. It doesn't look right. So why is it so messy? Well, the, the, the answer uh, actually is rather easy, uh, uh, rather the, the, the simple one, since we neglected one important factor, and that factor is a background shearing effect, which one should not really neglect to be consistent for the non-axisymmetric perturbation. It does not affect the uh, axisymmetric perturbations, but it, it, it seems to be crucial uh, for the non-axisymmetric one. The problem with that is that uh, it doesn't seem like there is a good relativistic uh, uh, paper describing how to do that in the relativistic regime. This is old work by Linden Bell and Goldreich from, from the 60s. And uh, Balbus in his uh, paper on non axisymmetric MRI is using that. Uh, but it, it is a much simpler system and we cannot expect to give any quantitative description of behavior of the commissar in this highly relativistic environment with that uh, system derived by, by Balbus Holley. Uh, so we have a significant problem with, uh, with this. We, we, ha we cannot take it into account because we don't know how to do that. Uh, and we should take it into account uh, because it clearly spoils the, the results in some region. Well, uh, this background shearing has some uh, characteristic frequency, which it corresponds, uh, it's close to the, uh, it's related to the omega. And omega is similar for both three models considered. So the characteristic rate for background shearing is basically constant, but the growth rate of the mode is different. And uh, for, for, that, uh, for that solution, it's more than three, than three times larger growth rate. So 
of course, when, it, uh, when these periods are so different, uh, the, then that fastest, fastest grow rate can show up in the simulation before it's, sh it's uh, sheared by the background. Uh, and that is the, our guess, why we have problem with uh, predicting small growth rates. And we, are, we have a very nice correspondence when we consider larger growth rates. So that would be that hand-waving uh, explanation of what, what is wrong that I uh, promised. And that would be it. Thank you very much. <laughs>